We good now? Oh yeah, that's better. Hi everybody. Hey, it's good to see so many friends and new faces. Uh, so this is Desired State Management with Jamf Pro. Uh, it says Casper Suite and all the documentation for the conference because it was named before the change. So, but I got the message. It's changed, so nobody at Jamf yell at me, please. Uh, I have these slides and examples, uh, at least some examples that you'll see later, uh, but they're all on my blog now if you want to grab them now so you don't have to frantically try to take pictures or write things down. Um, I'll also have that link up again at the end if you want to wait till the end to grab it. So for those of you who don't know, I am John Kitzmiller, or Kitsy. Uh, I do some Apple deployment consulting. I have to date helped deploy over 1 million Apple devices in 27 countries. I think it's actually 28 now, I need to update this slide. Uh, and I have a blog at johnkitzmiller.com that I think a few of you have probably been to. Um, I also currently work full-time for a company called Fastly. We are in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're a content delivery network. Um, we actually have an office here in London as well. And we have uh, points of presence all over the world to help deliver content to you. Um, we actually have two here in London as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, we are also always hiring. So if you're looking for a new gig, please check out fastly.com slash careers. There is an opening in the IT department right now, too, for those of you who are in IT, which I think is probably most of you. So yeah, have a look at that. So for anyone who's seen me talk before, or heard me talk before, or have read my blog or anything, I'm a big fan of automating as much as possible. I really hate having to do things manually. I hate having to make the same decision over and over again or you know, check things on my own. I really like to just make computers do the work for me, mostly because I'm lazy, um, which is probably why I got into IT in the first place. Um, so that's kind of what this talk is about today, is really about automation and how to make uh, make Jamf Pro do the work for you. So the whole idea behind desired state management is that we determine how we want a particular system to be configured. And we need to verify that that system's configured the way we want, and we need to have automation to fix it if it's not. That way we're not constantly checking to look for machines that are out of compliance and applying manual fixes. So we're going to do... Uh, most of the work today in uh, Jamf Pro policies, because configuration profiles by default are already kind of desired state where you set a setting and it keeps it set. It can't be changed, so that's good. So we don't have to touch on that. But I do want to do a quick refresher on how policies in Jamf Pro work. So there's four things that you need to have a successful policy. And those are the trigger, the execution frequency, the scope, and the payload. Is there anyone here that's not familiar with these things? <coughs> awesome. We're going to talk about it anyway. So the trigger is the event that causes the policy to run. So this is the thing that happens on the machine, whether it's the recurring check-in or log-in, log-out. You can have custom triggers as well. Um, but you have to have a trigger or your policy will never run. Next thing you have to have is your execution frequency. This determines how often the policy runs. And what I see a lot happen, what I see happening a lot is um, people going with once per computer because they think, oh, I want to install this application once on every computer. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, the idea here is that you have to determine how often your policy runs. By default, it'll be once per computer, and it'll never run again, even if the policy fails. <coughs> Equally important is scope. We have to tell Jamf Pro, what computers does this policy apply to? Um, you know, by default, there is no scope. There's nothing scoped. So if your policy is not running on any computers, this is the first thing you want to check. And then the final thing that you need for a success successful policy is a payload. And this is what the policy actually does, whether it's installing a package or running a script or creating a user account or working with file vault encryption, something of that nature. The payload is just what the policy actually does. So is there anyone here who's never made a policy in Jamf Pro or Casper Suite before? Liar. No? Really? We're not a Casper shop yet. Oh, that's right. You just told me that. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you a liar. It's okay. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> then pay attention to this next bit for you. Um, so uh, one of the things in, in a former career that I, I did was a lot of jump starts, getting people set up uh, with 
the time Casper Suite now Jam Pro. In fact, I think I see a few people in here whose jumpstart I did. Um, what I see people want to do a lot when they first get started is is this. You know, we want to we want to run our policy on recurring check, and we want to run it once per computer and scope it to all computers. And the idea is like we want to install this piece of software on every computer in the organization, and this isn't the best way to go for a number of ways, or a number of reasons rather. Um, when you do once per computer, like I said, mentioned earlier, if the policy fails, it doesn't run again because Jamf Pro assumes the policy ran, it doesn't have to run again, even though it's not successful. Um, the other issue you're going to run into is what happens down the road if that piece of software is uninstalled. It's not going to get reinstalled because you've literally told Jamf Pro to install this piece of software once and never do it again. The other problem we run into is with scoping to all computers. Um, this is another big thing I see. People think, I want you know, this application to go on every computer in my fleet, so I'm going to scope it to all computers. And the reason I don't like doing this is because some of your computers may already have that application installed. Um, and while it probably wouldn't be the end of the world if we reinstalled an application that was already there, when your fleet grows um, and you're you know, transferring bits over the internet using um, you know, AWS S3 buckets, for example, bandwidth can get really expensive really fast if you're doing a lot of unnecessary installations. Um, you know, so if you have end users on limited bandwidth connections, you don't want to be pushing bits down that they don't need. So um, I, I prefer to go uh, to find a better way to do things. So that's kind of what this talk is about today is how to um, automate things a little better so you're, you're making your uh, servers making better decisions for you. So uh, I was hoping to have four examples for you today. Unfortunately, one of them doesn't actually work. So we're going to have three examples. Uh, which should leave plenty of time for questions, so I hope there's a lot of questions uh, at the end. Otherwise, it's going to look like I didn't do a good job. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is installing a specific application, because that's kind of the example I was using before. So when you're dealing with desired state management, you have a few, um, a few things you have to do. Um, first step is you have to define what your desired state actually is. So in our example, we're going to use Slack. Um, we're also going to use a specific version of Slack, which uh, 2.4.1, which I believe is the latest version, at least it was as of a few days ago. Um, and so we want every computer in our fleet to have Slack version 2.4.1 installed. That's our st desired state. Next thing we want to think about is what are the possible states that the computer could be in? So in this instance, there's really kind of three states. And that is that Slack 2.4.1 is installed, and that's good. We don't need to do anything. It's already in the state we want. On the other side, we could have Slack's not installed. So obviously, that doesn't meet our criteria. Or a different version of Slack than what we want is installed. So that also wouldn't meet our criteria. So what we want to do now is we want to find computers that don't meet our desired state. And we're going to do that with a smart group in Jampro. Everyone familiar with smart groups? Cool. So this is a pretty simple uh, smart group. It's just got a little bit of criteria here for if the, um, if the computer has Slack, but it's not the right version, or if it doesn't have Slack at all, we want the machines to fall into this group. So essentially, what's going to happen is every time your computer submits inventory, it's going to update um, its standing in this smart group based on what's happening on the machine. So if um, you know, the user updates Slack and we're not ready to push out the update, they'll fall back into this group. Or if they have an older version installed, they'll fall in this group. If they delete Slack for some reason, they'll fall back into this group. Um, so I think you can kind of already see where this is going with you know, the automation side of things. So our next step is to take action on how we want to fix uh, this situation or put these computers into the desired state. So uh, I'm not going to go through how to package up Slack because I think everyone in here probably knows how to package an application. And we're probably good there. Um, but here is where we get into things like the um, execution frequency and the scope. So you'll notice I have it set to recurring check-in with a um, execution frequency of ongoing. And if you have your Jamf Pro server set so that your machines are checking in every 15 minutes, the immediate thought that comes to mind here is, well, wait a minute, doesn't that mean the application is going to get installed every 15 minutes? 
And it would be if you scoped it to all computers. But uh, you'll see here we scoped it to a smart group for updating Slack. So the idea here is that once you run this policy, if it's successful, the inventory will report back to Jamf Pro and tell, the, uh, tell Jamf Pro that you have Slack 2.4.1 installed. Your computer will then fall out of this smart group. And the next time the computer checks in, this policy will not apply because the computer is not in scope. Does that make sense, everybody? Are we cool with that? OK. So that's pretty easy. That's pretty basic. I think most people in here have probably done something very similar to this before. Um, so we're going to go into things that might not be quite as obvious. So for example, managing a specific setting. Now, a lot of these you can use configuration profiles for, and that's cool. Uh, if you can use a configuration profile, I highly encourage it. It's the easiest, fastest, most reliable way, in my opinion, to manage specific settings. But every now and then, you're going to run into something where even a custom configuration profile won't really fit the bill. Uh, it's just for whatever reason, the, the piece of software you're working with doesn't respect the configuration profile, or it's just, it just doesn't work. Um, so in that case, uh, we have to go with a different method. So like before, we're going to define our desired state. And in this case, we want every computer to automatically check for updates from the Mac App Store. This one's pretty easy. Um, defining the possible states. There's updates enabled, or they're not. Yes or no. So now we have to go back to our friend, the smart group, and figure out how to get, uh, get this information. And if you look through here, you'll see we, we don't actually have that criteria in our, in our smart groups. That's not something built into the inventory of Jamf Pro. There's no way to really tell that out of the box. So what do we do? Well, extension attributes are your friend here. Um, has anyone not used extension attributes before? A couple of you. Cool. This is going to be good then. All right. So extension attributes essentially are um, how you extend the inventory capabilities of Jamf Pro. So if it's something that the, um, that, that the inventory is not collecting by default and you want to know about it, this is how you do it. Um, and there's a few different ways to do extension attributes that I'm not going to get into, like having a pop-up menu where you manually select you know, a piece of criteria on the server itself, or you can just type in something. So you have like an asset tag field, which I think is actually already in there, but that would be an example of a field you'd type in. Uh, but for the automation, you can actually write uh, scripts that will report on things um, that you want to know about. So you can kind of see here how the extension attributes set up. Uh, I'm going to make that script a little bigger, so hopefully it's easier to see. Um, and this is a really simple uh, two-liner extension attribute where we're just taking a, a default read command for the plist that contains the setting for managing if computers check in automatically or not. And then it echoes that back in a pair of result XML tags. And that's what actually gets read back up into Jamf Pro and gets put into your inventory. So. Um, this is going to be a, a Boolean value. So it's going to be 0 or 1, 0 for false, 1 for true. Um, and then that's what we're going to see in our inventory. Now, you could go through and create a smart group and create a policy that then runs a command to fix this. But since we're already running a bash script, and we're going to have to run a bash script to fix it, you can actually just put the logic right into your extension attribute that tells it to fix it. So you'll see here, if it's not true, then what I'm doing is it's just a simple defaults write command that's going to fix the state. It's going to check again just to make sure it's, it's right and echo that back into Jamf Pro. So um, you know, there's still the slight possibility this command might fail for some reason. So you still want to make sure you're reporting back the correct data, which is why we run the, uh, the check again. Um, but in most cases, this should actually just fix the problem for you right away when inventory runs, rather than having to wait for the next check-in, for smart group logic to update, for policy to run. Um, you can go either way. I just think this is a little faster and easier in my mind. So our final example is maybe we don't want to manage a specific setting, but we want to manage an entire file. Uh, and you can do this by comparing MD5 hashes. So in this example, we want to to find the desired state again. So maybe you want to make sure that no one in your organization is updating their Etsy host file 
to override DNS settings that you are providing. Um, this is actually a thing that, that uh, I've had to do before. So we have our possible states. Etsy host is correct. It matches. It exists. Or the file's not there, which is real bad. Or it doesn't match what you want it to be, which is the default. Um, not as bad, but still bad. So the first thing we have to do is actually determine the MD5 hash of of uh, what our Etsy host file is. So you can do this in terminal just by running MD5 and then the file that you want to hash. And you'll get something that looks like this. And this is the MD5 hash of a default Etsy host file on a Mac OS computer running 10.12.3. I don't know if it's, if it's the same for other, com you know, other versions of the operating system, but for 10.12.3, this is the hash. So next, we have to create another extension attribute. And this one's a little more complicated. So what you can see here first is we're defining a couple of variables, um, the known hash, which is the hash we already grabbed, and the path of the file that we want to check. And then we're running, um, what we're going to do is we're going to use that same MD5 command to grab the hash from the file that's on the computer now. And if it doesn't exist, then we're going to you know, echo not found, because we want to know that the file's not there. If it does exist, we're going to compare the hashes. And if they match, everything's cool. We can just echo back match, and we're fine. If they don't match for whatever reason, then you're going to echo back no match. So back to our smart groups. We're going to do the same thing we did with Slack. We're going to make a smart group that looks for all the computers that don't match the desired state that we have defined. So if you remember from our example before, we had um, either no match or not found. Where the things that were returned that did not meet our criteria. So any computer that doesn't have an Etsy host file or has one that's been modified uh, will show up in this group. And then next, you need to take action once again. Uh, so here you would have a package that just deploys the correct file. Make sure the hash matches the file that you're actually deploying, not you know what's actually in the package and not just something you grabbed off your machine because it could be slightly different. Um, and then in which case, you would be constantly redeploying this file. Um, but this is kind of the same thing we did with Slack. We, we want to do it ongoing, because if it changes, we want, to happen, we want it to happen again. And we want to scope it to the smart group, because we don't want to deploy this unless we absolutely have to. So um, that's actually it. That was a lot shorter than I thought it was, so I really hope somebody has lots of questions. I think we've got some right up front here. So I had a question uh, about how you might be handling, uh, I guess, what is what I consider a challenge in that extension attributes only run during recon, which the most frequently you can run them is once per day, um, or on demand through a policy, I guess. Um, so I'm just curious, in a, in a scenario where you want to manage state, but you want to manage it more um, closely uh, than just checking for it once a day, if you're doing anything in particular. So that's an interesting problem. Um, you actually can run inventory more than once per day. You can actually run inventory ongoing, all computers, all the time. Don't do that. <laughs> That's really bad. Don't do that. Your, your database will get just absolutely massive, and Jamf support will yell at you. And if you're in Jamf Cloud, they'll yell at you. Um, but uh, so you can actually update the inventory more. But it's pretty much you, you're. But you're right in that you, your choices are kind of either um, once per day or ongoing. There's really no in between, like once every you know four hours or something like that. Um, my advice there is, depending on what you're trying to manage, I would look into doing it with configuration profiles if you can, because that's going to be a constant that can't be changed by the end user easily. Um, outside of that, if it's something that's, that's really that important, um, are, are your users uh, admins on their machines, by chance? Uh, many, yeah, a lot of people, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so we, we our users are all admins as well, because a lot of them are developers. And if you take admin rights away from developers, they get cranky. Um, so. Yeah, that it really, once you give someone admin rights on the machine, it becomes really hard to just blanket enforce something and have it never change, always stick. So um, really the best you know you can do is just kind of rely on that once per day inventory. Um, and also inventory sometimes will update more often, such as if another policy runs that calls inventory updates. So you can get more often than not. Um, I know in, in my organization and most of the organizations I consult with, having that check once per day is usually more than enough. Does that answer your question? Mostly, kind of? OK. I think Rich had a question. 
up here in the front? Um, yeah, with the example. Oh, sorry. So with the uh, example of using MD5 hashes, um, have you generally noticed over time that uh, the hashes on the files that Apple supplies do not change, or is this something you have to watch out for, or, or what? It's definitely something you want to keep an eye on. Um, because I have seen hashes change on files after updates. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, this is something that I've only started implementing recently, so I don't have a ton of you know, time uh, experience with this. But um, yeah, you do definitely want to keep an eye on it, um, you know, because if the hashes change, then your policies start running every single time, and that's bad, obviously. Um, so I would only do this when absolutely necessary for, for the hashes. I would find other ways to, to, to manage things um, if you can. I think we have one way up there. Um, if you've got a policy running for desired state, um, what are your thoughts on, for example, let's say, oh, blast, I can't think of an example now, but you, you want to achieve a desired state. In order to be able to check that that has fallen into that desired state, what are your thoughts on ensuring that you're running an inventory at the end of that policy? Because otherwise, would it not mean that every time it checks in, until it's reached that 24-hour inventory cycle, it's going to think that it's not in that desired state, even though that policy is being applied every 15 minutes? Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. And I'm really glad you asked that, because I'm realizing I forgot to mention that in all these examples. Whenever you're making a change to the system that will affect the inventory, especially if it's something that you have smart groups scoped on, I would always update the inventory at the end of a policy run. Um, I think that's just best practice, in my opinion. Because um, otherwise, like you said, if, if you don't update the inventory, then it's going to wait until the next inventory update, and your policy is going to run every time the computer checks in otherwise. So that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I think we have one down right in front of you. Thanks. <coughs> Um, we've got one user who, um, he's a developer and uh, is a bit fickle over his Mac, and uh, one day he threw his toys out the pram and he deleted the Jamf malware, as he calls it, <laughs> and deleted the agent and everything off his machine. Um, is there a way to have a, is it possible to have the state, uh, a set state for the Jamf agent, for example, so it has to be there at the, at the right version so that... Yes and no. Um, the trouble being, of course, once you remove the Jamf agent, you no longer have the ability to use Jamf to manage the machine, obviously. Um, Rich Troughton actually has a wonderful uh, set of scripts called Casper Check, uh, if you haven't seen, that uh, is something you can install on the machines that will check to make sure it's enrolled and re-enroll it if not. Now, that's kind of subject to the same problem that you're talking about, though, because the user could also remove Casper Check. Really, as soon as the user has admin writes on the machine, there's really no bulletproof way to completely eliminate that problem. So in my mind, that becomes less of a technology problem and more of a, you know, a management problem. Um, you know, in our organization, we just have it kind of set very clear in our you know, acceptable use policies that you know, users are not to remove the agent from their computers that's required to be there. And if someone removes it, it, it fastly, then we just have a conversation with that person's manager who then talks to them. Um, that's really how we handle that. <laughs> that was impressive running. Um, I was just going to reply to add on to that. Um, I've also seen people tie important uh, items to the Jamf install. So if you you could prevent, for instance, uh, VPN or Wi-Fi from working. If you put it in a configuration profile that's been installed by the Jamf binary, they uninstall it, it goes away, and bye-bye Wi-Fi. That's, yeah, that's a great way to do that, too, is, is you know, make sure things that people want are happening because of Jamf. And if, you if they remove Jamf, those things go away. That's a really good way to keep people enrolled. Um, I know uh, when I worked for Jamf software, um, there was a, a time I unrolled my machine for some reason. Um, I forget why. Bryson did something that annoyed me. And uh, I was in the Jamf office and, and went to Bryson and said, hey, uh, can, I, can I get the information to print this printer? He goes, yeah, it's in self-service. I'm like, oh, I unrolled. He's like, well, it's in self-service. So you know, that's, a good, that's a really good way to keep people enrolled without uh, having to you know, enforce things is just to you know, make it easier for them to be enrolled than not. Anybody else? Right there, right in front of you. 
Hi, John. Hi, Bryson. How you doing? <laughs> All right, um, your new method of uh, configuration management through MD5 hashes. How many separate files are you doing that with right now? One. Just the one? Just the one that I used in the example. How, uh, would you change how you, instead of doing the extension attribute policy pair with the smart group, mm -hmm. would you, do you, have you been putting any thoughts into how you would scale this if you were, say, doing 10 different files? Because you might not want to have 10 separate policies, 10 se 10 separate extension attributes and you know 10 separate smart groups for managing that automation. Yeah, that, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of expensive computation for, for simple things. So that if you have to do a lot of those, it might not be the way to go. Um, one of the things I was thinking about was having the um, having the files that the you know known good files on the machine already and just having a script that runs a diff on all of them against what they're supposed to be. But then the problem you run into is the user could change those files as well. So um, you, know, you could also have a script that then pulls down, um, pulls down the files and does a diff. But then you're pulling down the files every time inventory runs and if you need them or not. So that kind of doesn't really help either. Um, I would say if, if you have that many files that you have to you know, lock down and manage that way, you might want to look into why that is, would be my um, my recommendation. So that's a theoretical question. <laughs> I figured. How are you doing, by the way, Bryson? Uh, I, I'm just great. You know, I love hearing stories about how you unmanaged your computer because I ticked you off and then you lost something that you needed. Yeah. Yeah. You, you did a good job there by making it, you know, making me want to be enrolled because there was things I needed. That was good management style. We're in a room. Anybody else? No? I got one. Got one over there. Oh, is that Charles? Oh, no. <laughs> so I, I noticed in your, in your extension attribute, you were echoing different statuses and the results. Um, when do you choose to do it that way as opposed to just uh, like echoing a variable at the end? and the variable is set to one of those three things in a case statement versus doing that. And then second part of that is when you're writing a whole bunch of extension attributes, when do you choose to move to like having a second daemon that just does the stuff so that you're just grabbing the text file? Great questions. So for your first question, I think um, it really just depends on how I'm feeling that day. I'm writing a script. I mean, it's um, you know kind of six to one, half a dozen to the other, in my opinion. Um, you know, a lot of times if there's, you know, multiple, um, you know, if it's just like we're just reading, like the, the first example where we're just reading a, a plist and it's, you know, yes or no, then I think just echoing what you read from the plist is cool. Um, when there's a couple, you know, more than two options, you know, different options, and, you know, I want to decide what they actually say versus just reading what's on the computer. That's usually when I go uh, with the, the second route, um, if that makes sense. Does that, does that, am I answering your question? Is that cool? Um, and then the second question was, um, I'm generally not a fan of putting daemons on the machine um, that aren't already there just because um, you know, most of my users are developers and so they look at that stuff and when they see a lot of daemons they don't recognize, they start deleting them. And then now I have to write extension attributes to make sure those daemons are there and policies to put them back and it's just, you know, it's a never ending cycle. So um, you know, in, in organizations where users aren't admins, that's actually might be a better way to do it. But for the deployments I work on, it's just, you know, creates another layer of complexity that doesn't need to be there. Well done, John. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.